Hi, everyone. It's good to be with you again as we continue and conclude our series of Drawing Closer Devotions and this study on the book of James. You know, throughout the book of James, we have seen what we have called positive and practical advice for the Christian life. James has talked to us about such things as dealing with trials, asking for wisdom, and understanding that our words and the things that we say are powerful. And of all this advice that we've studied in the book of James, and of all the different tools and tips for living that James has given us, perhaps James has saved the best for last. Because in today's study, we're going to talk about two different concepts that are crucial for the Christian life, but very difficult for us to put into practice. Those two concepts are patience and prayer. If we understand and live out these two virtues, if we are people who are patient in the face of suffering, if we are people who are constantly in prayer, we ourselves can obtain the power that comes from the Holy Spirit and the power we need to live lives that honor God and look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. Let's begin our study with the word of prayer. Father God, we thank you. We thank you and praise you for this book of James and for the many times that we have gotten together either in person or over Facebook to study these words. And Lord, James tells us that we shouldn't just hear these words, but we should put them into practice. So Lord, give me words to speak and give us all ears to hear. Help us, Lord, to hear these tools and these commands that James gives us. And then, Lord, help us by the power of the Holy Spirit to put them into practice. Lord, let our thoughts and our doings today reflect a desire to give you glory, honor, and praise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, as I thought about this study and these two crucial topics that James addresses in this last chapter of his letter, I could not help but think of a verse that comes from the book of Isaiah. It was one of my grandfather's favorite verses. He used to wear an eagle pendant around his neck to remind him of it. Isaiah 40, 31, they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. What does it mean to wait on the Lord? Well, to wait on the Lord requires the very things that James talks about in this letter. It requires first that we are patient people, and then that we are people of prayer. Now, James begins verse 7 by saying, be patient. And then in verse 8 again, he says, you to be patient and stand firm. James talks about the face of patience and the importance of patience, not just when things are good, but in all circumstances. You'll remember that James, in the beginning of chapter 5, has talked about these rich oppressors. And this was something that was familiar to people who were reading James' letter. They were oppressed. They were facing persecution. They were facing difficult times. And James, in response to these things, tells Christians and tells us to be patient to be patient, to wait on the Lord's coming, to remember that even in the face of suffering, Christ himself suffered, and therefore we can endure with patience the trials and the tribulations that we are facing and feeling. And throughout this beginning section, James tells us that we should, instead of complaining, Consider the idea of patience and how it is displayed in the Lord's people. He brings up a man that many people relate to when they're dealing with suffering, and that is Job. We know the story of Job. Job was a man who had it all and then lost it all. He was afflicted, and afflicted, it seems, for no good purpose. And throughout the book of Job, Job is questioning what is happening to him. He wants an audience with God. And we would, I think, say that Job is a little bit complaining in some of the things that he says. He is not happy with the circumstances that he is facing. So we want to ask, how can James tell us, well, don't groan or don't grumble, and then say, but Job is an example. Didn't Job complain? Didn't Job suffer? Didn't Job ask and wonder what was happening to him? Well, here's the key in what James is saying and in using the example of Job. 
When Job faced difficulties, who did he direct them towards? He directed them appropriately to God. He did not curse God. He did not so much put the blame on God. Instead, he prayed. He directed this complaint to God, and that was properly directed at God rather than directed at someone or something else. When James says, don't grumble, don't groan, don't moan, he's talking about more than this just occasional comment that we might make. We've all made comments, and in recent days I've made a lot of comments or complaints about the fact that we keep getting snow and ice and that I'm tired of it. James isn't talking about that kind of complaining so much as he's talking about an attitude and a lifestyle. And we can have one of two attitudes or one of two lifestyles. We can live a life that is full of complaint and selfish and self-centered, always thinking about what is wrong in our lives, or we can have an attitude that counts our blessings, an attitude that always tries to see what God is doing in the midst of our circumstances, an attitude that rather than complains, chooses to pray. And that's the very next topic that James addresses in his letter. At the beginning of verse 13, James begins this series of rhetorical questions. These are James's ideas of when we should pray. Look at the ideas that James puts forth in this first verse of verse 13. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him. James's point is this. There is always time to pray. And in whatever circumstances we are facing, there are times and ways to direct that to the Lord. First, he says, is anyone in trouble? And that Greek word trouble relates to a general sense of trouble. It could be almost anything. It's nothing specific. It's just whatever you are facing. And there are all kinds of troubles we face in this life. There are troubles of illness when we are sick. There are troubles of finance. There are troubles in relationships. When we get in trouble, our first resort should be to pray. But all too often, that's our last resort. And so James is reminding us here at the beginning of this passage of Scripture that when we are in trouble, the first thing we should do is look to the Lord. It doesn't matter what kind of trouble we're in. Then he says, if we're happy, we should sing songs of praise. And this is also a form of prayer. But again, too often when things are going well in our lives, we forget to do the very thing that we should. We forget to thank God. We forget to sing these songs of praise. We forget to give testimony to the goodness of the Lord. When things are going well, sometimes we forget our need for God. And James is saying, do not do that. When things are good, pray. Thank God. Praise his name. And then finally he says, is anyone sick? That's the word the NIV uses. Now that word for sick is an interesting word because James isn't using it to say, does anyone have a case of the sniffles or is anyone dealing with a physical illness alone? That word sick can actually be translated as weak. It can be a physical weakness or it can be a spiritual weakness. It could even be an emotional weakness weakness. This is the time that we need others to pray for us. And even the act of asking for prayer is an act of faith. You know, there's that old song, lean on me when you're not strong. That's what James is telling us in these verses of scripture. He's saying, when we are not strong enough, when we are in desperate need, we should call others to pray for us. We should call on the community of faith, the leaders of the community of faith, strong Christians to come and lift us up in prayer. And I'm so blessed to say that our church has a wonderful ministry of intercessory prayer. It's one of the things in this church that we are most blessed by. We are a church that prays for one another. That's something we need to continue to do. 
And James's reminder is, yes, continue to pray for others, but it's also a reminder to some of us who may feel, well, I don't want to bother anybody. This is something I can handle on my own. I don't want anyone to feel that they need to take care of me. This is the reminder that James says, there will be times in your life when you're not strong enough on your own. This is the moment to go to others, and it's good to ask others to pray for you. It's good to be patient. It's good to pray. And why is it good to have these two attitudes? Well, let me just highlight one last verse from this section of Scripture. It says in verse 16, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Our prayers can be powerful and effective. But if they're going to be powerful and effective, we must be righteous people. And we read this statement, and then we see that James picks on Elijah as an example of what it is to be a righteous man. And you may be thinking, well, yes, Elijah was a righteous man, but how can I possibly fit that description? I have a lot of problems in my life. I've got a lot of difficulties. I'm not perfect. Notice what James says. He does not say the prayer of a perfect man is righteous and effective. If James said that, that you had to be perfect in order to have effective prayer and effective prayer life, we'd all be out because none of us is perfect. But we can be righteous people. And what does that mean? It means, first of all, that we have a right relationship with God. It means that we are seeking to live our lives for his glory. It means that we have confessed our sins and we are in right relationship through the Father with Jesus Christ. It's possible for all of us to be righteous. It's possible for us to have right relationship with God, and that is possible through Jesus Christ. How do we have these traits in our lives? How can we be the people that are patient in affliction? How can we be the people that look to God and have powerful prayers that are answered? We do it by depending on Jesus Christ. If we were left to our own devices, and if we tried to do this on our own, we'd just be the very people that James tells us not to be. We'd be people who complain and who wonder, why are our lives the way they are? Why isn't God hearing our prayers? If we try to do it in our own strength or on our own righteousness, it's not enough. We go to prayer because of the goodness of Jesus Christ. We approach the throne of grace because of the grace that has been given to us in Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, Today and each day, we will surely face troubles of many kind. James opened his book by reminding us that we can rejoice in these circumstances. And he closes his book by giving us the understanding and the tools that can help us face these circumstances with joy. We must be people of patience and we must be people of prayer. I want to thank you for joining me through this study of the book of James and for our devotion today. Let's close our time together by once again looking to the Lord in prayer. Father God, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whenever we are watching this, we give you thanks for Jesus Christ. For it's in Jesus Christ that we have forgiveness of our sins, and it's in Jesus Christ that we can approach your throne of grace with confidence and with boldness. Lord, as we have heard the instruction through the book of James, we pray now that you would allow us to put these things into practice. Lord, make us the people who are patient and who are people of prayer. Hear our prayers, meet our needs, and help us be the people that share the gospel and encourage others to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, we don't do this for ourselves, but all for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.